Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns and McDonnell, with additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises, and by A pipe dream becomes reality at the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts. Meet the local Caldecott medal judge who helps decide the nation's best children's picture book. Plus, transforming what for so long has been the city's racial dividing line, we track the chamber's new plan to rejuvenate the Troost Corridor. And we go behind the scenes with the Grammy Award-winning Kansas City Corral. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation. William T. Kemper Foundation, Commerce Bank Trustee, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Hall Family Foundation, Johnson County Community College. Additional support provided by and KCPT members. Thank you. And I'm Nick Haynes, and welcome to The Local Show. Six months after the opening of the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts, one of its most potent acoustic features has never been fully appreciated. That is, until now. We begin this half hour on The Local Show by introducing you to this newly installed musical centerpiece inside Hellsberg Hall. A pipe organ, considered one of the finest concert instruments in the country. Crafted in the French Romantic tradition, it features close to 6,000 pipes, 79 stops, and 102 ranks. It was built by Cossavant, the 125-year-old French-Canadian firm, a company renowned for quality organs that have stood the test of time. People are always surprised, but it's like a puzzle, you know, uh, especially uh, for this organ. I, I took care of it at the factory to assemble it the first time. Then I know pretty well, uh, you'll show me a piece, I'll, sh I'll tell you where it goes most of the time, you know. Even if, if it's a pipe or a frame or a chest or uh, any other components, because uh, it's a machine, then there's a lot of uh, mechanism inside. The organ made its debut the weekend of March 10th with two sold-out performances by James David Christie, organ consultant and professor of organ at the Oberlin College Conservatory. It's a marvelous instrument. It's very easy to play and it's very user friendly. I mean, it looks huge, but everything's there and everything works. The biggest problem with this organ is trying to decide what not to use. And with most organs, you're trying to find can I find the right sound? And here you, are, you find you have five or six correct sounds, and then you've just got to choose the best. The purpose of my program, it's a very diverse program of repertoire, and the purpose is, was to show the organ. And not so much to show the organ, it's to show the organ. That's what a, a recitalist obligation is at a dedication, is to really do everything you can to give them good music, but to show the colors of the organ. I think that this organ will definitely be one of the top concert hall organs, not only in the United States, but in the world. This organ is not shy. It can be practically inaudible, and it can be also, it can, it'll fill this entire room. This instrument has so much variety and so much possibility, and it's a fascinating instrument to play as well as to hear, and that is really a, a wonderful experience. It's, it's gonna be such a great addition to the cultural life of Kansas City. For a long 
long time in the city, people have lamented why so little progress, so little improvement and economic development has happened east of Troost Avenue, what has been the symbolic geographic racial divide in the city. Now the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce has agreed to throw its entire weight and influence behind changing that. As part of what it calls its Big Five initiative, the Chamber has picked the Troost Corridor for unprecedented focus and civic attention. Today is a big day, a big day for Big KC and for the Chamber's Big Five. And our total commitment is to work on transforming the east side of Kansas City. Anybody here, give me a drum roll. I have never seen such a broad spectrum of support to help our community. We've got business, civic, philanthropic leadership here. So no more talk, no more lamenting, no more commiserating. It's now time to kind of roll the sleeves up, pick up some hammers, some, tent, some, some nails, some saws and other tools, and let's get something done. For all the hoopla, what does it all really mean? Now here with us is the Chamber's President and CEO, Jim Heater, and the Chair of the Board of Directors of the United Way, which is partnering with the Chamber on this effort, Diane Cleaver. We very much appreciate you both being with us, but help us understand, first of all, Jim, when the Chamber came up with the Big Five six months ago, it was going to be an urban neighborhood. Now, we were expecting a specific neighborhood to be selected. Why was it the Troost Corridor that was selected? It was selected, uh, it was selected Nick, because it is a specific neighborhood. To be honest, it's a collection of neighborhoods that runs along the Troost Corridor. Now, this, is tr this is Troost, by the way, to Bruce Watkins Drive, 23rd Street to 51st Street. This Correct. is a, quite a large stretch here. It's a very sizable area. On the other hand, what makes this special from a lot of other initiatives in the past is it is a defined and contained area. We are not going to attempt to solve every problem in the entire urban core neighborhoods of Kansas City, Missouri. What we've done is select one neighborhood, a collection of neighborhoods, really a pretty good sized piece of real estate, and we're going to systematically approach every single issue that needs to be approached in that area to make it one of the most livable communities in our entire metropolitan area. What is it that you're going to actually be doing in this area, though, Diane? We're going to be working collaboratively, and I suppose that's one of the most important things we can put forth about this whole effort. It's a collaboration with the neighborhood residents uh, within those areas. Uh, we're going to be working with them collaboratively really to develop a plan to, so we can't be real specific about what we're going to do until we develop a plan with them that focuses on the areas that they see as priorities, but to make this a very livable area and we know that it'll be within the context of health, safety, uh, financial stability, and education. But it was those lack of specifics, though, when this news conference took place that had some reporters, you know, uh, uh, looking for blood, you know. Oh, why? Here we go again. Another plan that's going to gather dust and nothing's going to happen. Well, you're right, uh, certainly, that some people, uh, I think that's one of the most frequently asked questions, well, exactly what, what is it that you're going to do? And we can't be partners if we come in and say, well, here's what we're going to do before we have an extensive dialogue with our partners. Here's an email. This is from the original story that appeared in the Kansas City Star about picking the Truce Corridor. This came from Get It Real 85. You know who you are, Get It Real 85. Okay, and this was what it said. Typical KC Chamber effort. Press conference, usual suspect sign on, 20-year time frame, Nothing gets done, but nobody will care since all we will be, all of this will be forgotten a year from now, Jim. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure who uh, who 85 is, but 85 couldn't be uh, couldn't be more wrong, frankly, and with all due respect. Um, for one thing, this is not a 20-year effort; it's a long-term effort, as Diane mentioned. This is not a three-month, a four-month, a six-month effort. The Chamber, the Big Five, United Way are here to stay. There are some real differences with this. One of them Diane mentioned, and that is there is a unique set of partners who have come together, not just from the business community and not just from United Way, but also the city of Kansas City, Missouri, the University of Missouri at Kansas City, Rockhurst College, and on and on. And we've actually formed an organization. There's a board, there's a corporate board that exists, UNI, Urban Neighborhood Initiative, LLC. That organization, we hope, will actually be here doing things productively in 20 years. It'll take a few months, maybe even a year or two, to start to see tangible results. But as those begin to happen, they'll be noticeable. 
can you give us a couple of some concrete ideas of what you'd like to see happen? I think one of the things that we have heard most frequently revolves around economic development in those communities, uh, helping to bring small businesses, helping to do things like a grocery store, which there's already an effort underway uh, that John Bluford is kind of spearheaded. But economic development is one thing with the businesses in the community as well as a path to jobs. So maybe that's job training, but that economic stability is a real key thing. I think you hear a lot about safety of the neighborhoods uh, and you know the, the chief of police has been working with us, we'll be partnering with the police department, but what can we do, you know, whether it has to do with improved lighting, improved neighborhood watch, uh, things that go on within the neighborhood activities to improve safety. So, I mean, those are just a, a couple examples of some of the areas. Because we got this email from uh, Bob, police, foot patrols, demolish drug houses and enforcement of city codes would be a good start until violence, drugs and blight are removed. Nobody in their right mind would want to live there, Jim. I would agree with that email. That would be a good start. I think, I think you'll see those to be some of the first issues addressed because when you talk about the issues that Diane spoke so eloquently about, including public education and job creation, um, public safety has to be really at the top of that list. A neighborhood has to be and feel secure before you can do some of these other things. Were there any concerns, Jim, about, well, why was it this area that was selected? Um, you know, I live on 52nd Street or I live on 22nd Street and I'm not going to get any of the benefits out of this. Uh, you know, what's been interesting to me, Nick, is that, that we have gotten very, pu very little pushback uh, or blowback on that issue because we did look at neighborhoods throughout the urban core and um, I really expected there to be more of that but I think what people are happy about is that this group of folks is coming together to do what we're talking about in this urban neighborhood initiative and part of the philosophy here is that once this gets traction once this began to work then we can replicate it we can go on to the next neighborhood and I think people understand that how will you know you're being successful we will have clearly identified outcome indicators. I mean, we were, want to be very serious about this. If we uh, have an economic development initiative as part of our plan, we will identify the indicators. You know, is it so many jobs? Is it so many businesses of uh, you know, a certain amount of size? Is it so many uh, uh, dollars that we brought into the community? We will put those indicators out there, and then we will measure ourselves against them as we move forward. You can learn more, by the way, about the Chamber's Big Five initiative and find out what the other Big Five ideas are at big5kc.com. Jim Heater and Diane Cleaver, thank you so much for being with us. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. What do beloved children's books, The Polar Express, Where the Wild Things Are, Madeline, and The Invention of Hugo Cabret have in common? They've all been honored by the Caldecott Committee, which annually selects the winner of the prestigious Caldecott Medal, which honors the nation's best children's picture books. Believe it or not, only 15 judges helped select the Caldecott Prize winner, and one of them is from Kansas City. Her name is April Roy, and she can normally be found in the children's section of the Plaza Branch of the Kansas City Library. I was recently able to pull her away to join us for a conversation on The Local Show. I don't know if I've ever actually sat with someone who spent so much time looking at, uh, at children's picture books as a part of their responsibilities, but it sounds like that was your, uh, your 2011 maybe, spent a whole lot of time just doing that. It's exactly what I did. Um, it just sort of became my hobby. In the evenings after work and after my day was quiet, I would read picture books. I read over a thousand picture books last year. And the mission, of course, was to be able to judge them on a panel that includes, I think, people from libraries and the world of children's literature from all over the country. How, how does one actually get chosen to even be, be one of, is it 16? Um, there are 15 on the committee, and it, it's a huge honor for a children's librarian. Um, the award, the Randolph Caldecott Medal, is administered by the Association of Library Services for Children, which is a division of the American Library Association. Um, so a couple springs ago, I was actually on the ballot, the national ballot, um, a ballot of 16, and I was elected to the committee. Um, half of the committee is elected, and the other half of the committee is appointed by the president of ALSC. 
and this award for which you get a medal, which a lot of us who've had kids go through uh, the, the, and maybe even remember ourselves, that, that you know, getting that, that medal attached to a book was a really big deal. Yeah. It is a big deal. Um, it makes the book stand out. It makes kids go, ooh, this book has a shiny metal. This must be a really special book. And these books that we choose really are special. Um, for an illustrator, which is who is awarded the Caldecott Medal, it's for illustration, not for writing. Um, for that illustrator, it's often the peak of their career. Um, it guarantees book sales for them. It guarantees their book will probably stay in print for a really long time. And it guarantees that lots of kids will see it and love it. Sounds like a lot of responsibility for someone who's then going to make those choices. I mean, as you say, you looked through so many books, uh, and you're thinking, oh, only how many get the, the medal? One. <laughs> One gets the medal. Um, the committee does get to choose honor books that receive a silver medal, but we select one book of the year that wins the medal, and it is a really hard process. Um, I poured over these books and thought about um, their artistic merit, among other things. Um, looking at the book as a total package, um, text integrated with the pictures to make it the most distinguished book of the year. That's what we're charged with. And you can reveal? The actual winner, the Caldecott, Caldecott medalist uh, for 2012 is? I can. Um, the 2012 Caldecott medal was awarded to Chris Rashka's A Ball for Daisy. Um, the story of a little dog who um, his favorite toy gets broken. He experiences the stages of grief and then makes a new friend. This was the 75th book that's been awarded the Caldecott medal. I'm wondering, is children's literature you know, booming at this point in time? And there's, there's a lot of things out there to distract kids, but it seems like a good book still works. Oh, good books are great for kids, and kids appreciate them on so many levels. Um, we are keeping up with technology, and kids mm -hmm. are you know, experiencing e-books and digital books and things like that. But a good print book, you just can't quite go wrong. I was going to say, come on. There's just something yeah. about you know, the, way it, the way it looks, the way it feels. Mm -hmm. I, I'd hate to think it's all going to be done with zeros and ones no. down the line. No, I think books will stay around, and um, I'm a big fan of picture books, and I think that um, the more people think outside the box in how to use picture books, the more uh, wide an audience they can have. You got started with, I believe, what books was it that, uh, that were your... your uh entree into all this, the Little House books, maybe? I loved the Little House books. I was a big reader as a kid. Um, we didn't have a lot of a lot of extra things when I was a kid, but my mom would never tell us no if we wanted books. She would, <laughs> she would get us books. We went to the library. I was a library kid. I walked there after school every day and um, got to stamp the cards and all of those things as a child. And, and those experiences really stuck with me, and I never stopped loving children's literature. I like that you just said stamp the card. Because that's something that, <laughs> that I can, I can, I <laughs> can go back to that probably isn't in the mm -hmm. in the world of kids uh, and library experiences. But if someone was going to shush me, I'd, I'd be glad to, <laughs> if it was someone like April Roy, who obviously you. loves your job and loves what this opportunity to work with the Caldecott Medal. We're we're glad that Kansas City can contribute in that way. Oh, I think it's wonderful. Um, the Kansas City Public Library is doing so many great things now. Um, we're working towards building a whole community of readers. Building a community of readers is our new initiative. Initiative. And we're starting at the bottom with early literacy and kids and getting them involved all the way up to adults. So we're really trying to cover everyone in our city. April Roy, Great. thanks for joining us oh, on the local so show. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was totally a pleasure. With a concert coming up at the Kaufman Center on May 12th and a new CD on the way this summer, the Kansas City Chorale continues to be a vital part of our city's cultural life. 30 years of music making that's been honored with Grammy Awards and international acclaim. This week in conjunction with KC Studio Magazine, our Perform Art series zooms in on the Chorale. It begins with a glimpse at how three of the singers stay busy when they're not on stage. When I was five years old, I started singing in my church choir, and I haven't stopped singing since. Is there anybody here who loves my Jesus? Anybody here who loves my I got a call from a friend, and uh, they had a little choir that they were putting together and wanted to know if I could sight read. 
Well, it's been a ride. It's been quite a ride. It's a wonderful experience. You learn something from Charles every time you're with him, something different. You know, it's a really special thing, but th what makes it special is hard to put into words. Oh, you know, I sing in this thing that has this transformational power and you just have to be there, you know? The words don't really do it justice. are we aiming for? Heart. heart. Okay. Can you give it to me again with a little more heart? The way I think about it is I can't imagine not doing it. It sounds so silly, but that's how I feel about it. It's so much a part of my soul, you know. I feel like I grew up in the group. In fact, at one point I was the youngest soprano. I am now the oldest soprano. Their tenures are as varied as the day jobs they hold. But all 24 singers in the Kansas City Chorale share one thing, a commitment to the pursuit of vocal music at the highest levels. Whether their daytime duties call for managing a dental office, licensing artwork for Hallmark, or teaching music in a school or church, they all happily put the real world behind them to chase artistic perfection. A one, two, three. With plenty of encouragement from this man. Rehearsal, concert, rehearsal, concert. I never reached the finish line. Charles Bruffy didn't form the chorale, but he's been a part of the group since the beginning and served as its conductor and artistic director for 25 years now. Finding a way to make good individual voices work even more effectively as a unit is something he never seems to tire of. I'm always seeking something and, and looking for newness in music that we already know, looking for new music that no one knows. The conductor's job is to bring the music together because the most important thing to us is that the listener have feeling about what we do, that we illuminate the music. When we go to concert, I always hope that it sounds like it's the first time that anyone has ever heard this piece. That we aren't just grinding through the song another time. They seldom give Grammys for grinding it out, and Charles has earned two. One for his work here, the other with the Phoenix Chorale, which she's also been conducting for the past 13 years. I don't mind at all the travel part of it. My car knows the way to the airport. It's a real conversation starter when you're looking at music and people look over to see what you're doing and they always ask. And I make new friends with them all the time. And then they come to the concerts. Charles is a networker and that is very important in uh, and fundraising, and he's very well respected. I think that helps a lot. It's hard for me to imagine being Charles and having these two premier choirs, and then also the symphony chorus as well, sounding very beautiful too. Um, how does he balance all that? Sometimes by mixing and matching the choirs as Bruffy will in May, when the group shifts away from the churches where it usually performs to sample the acoustics in Hellsberg Hall. Fittingly, the music they'll make is Russian, full of the room-rumbling compositions that brought the chorale its first national attention some 20 years back. We're going to be bringing some of the singers from Phoenix, especially the low basses, just so we can have a 
an additional footstool, we call. For singers, the chance to join with other great voices offers rewards beyond the merely financial. For Scott Hansen, the newest kid on the choral block, every time out is a chance to learn lessons from the veterans he stands between. You know, we have people drive from Independence, and I've heard people driving from Warrensburg, and when you take the paycheck and compare it to the gas it takes to get there, it's just above break even. It is much less a commitment to a paycheck than it is a commitment to the art, a commitment to your passion. We've gone through things together with family situations and deaths and births, and being able to sing together can be that healing or that celebration. There's just stuff that you can do through singing that you can't, I can't express it to you in words. The Kansas City Chorale with guests from the Phoenix Chorale will perform masterworks by Russian composers in Hellsburg Hall on Saturday, May 12th. I'm Nick Haynes, that's it for this week. We'll see you next time on The Local Show. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, William T. Kemper Foundation, Commerce Bank Trustee, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Hall Family Foundation, Johnson County Community College. Additional support provided by and KCPT members. Thank you. Special coverage on KCPT of the Greater Kansas City Chamber's Big Five initiatives is funded by Burns and McDonnell, with additional financial support from Swope Community Enterprises, and by